Hi, everybody. Sunita here. So hello and welcome to the Healing Shift podcast hosted by myself, Sunita Passi. Um, now, each time I talk with people who are active in the world of creating change, whether they're working with individuals or communities um, and with methods that might be rooted in their business, and that could be old and new approaches to spirituality or to well-being or to healing. It's in all its myriad forms. This is what we really cover on this podcast, Heal and Shift. So what they share um, is a desire to work for the good of, the, of people and also the planet in ways that actually seed change. Um, and in the course of their journeys, they've experienced insights that make them more of the people that we can all be at our best. And um, these conversations, which I've all really been, you know, enjoying and loving, um, have, you know, they're for everyone. They're for everyone to listen. And um, really knowing that you've joined today makes me grateful for, for all of those on the same wavelength. So today um, we get to meet Christopher Sell. And I came across Christopher's work um, at least five years ago through a colleague of mine who actually um, had discovered his training and recommended um, the sessions to me. And um, he, Chris's sessions really helped me personally understand myself, my place in the world. And also they did, they brought me a, a great sense of peace. And um, so Chris describes himself, he's a channel and a teacher, and he shares his work through a platform called Heaven on Earth. He started this work 30 years ago, and he's um, worked with hundreds of people over the years to help them appreciate the magnificence of their own being. So let's tune into this wonderful conversation now. Hello, Chris. Hi, Sunita. Hi, hi. Chris, this is fascinating backstory, fascinating work. Um, I'm personally truly fascinated, you know, having had the first-hand experiences of your sessions. Was there anything in your early life that pointed to the life that you're living now? It's an interesting question. It's not entirely easy to answer because the answer, truthfully, is both yes and no. So I think that to an outside observer, there really would have been absolutely no indication whatsoever of this particular path, um, except that possibly I seemed a little weird to some of my contemporaries and elders. And I seemed a little weird to myself as well, I think. Um, but I had no conscious sense of this being the kind of path I would follow. That, however, is not entirely true, because I think that what I did, and I think that this is a human thing rather than personal to me, is that I compartmentalized my life. And so there was another part of me existing in parallel to the uh, outer world self that was wandering, that was connecting with other kinds of realities. Um, but most of the time, I really wasn't telling myself about that. It was uh, when I came across in childhood, came across the line, the witch in the wardrobe, and that wonderful idea of the being uh, a, a, a door at the back of the wardrobe into which you could go to an entirely another world. That resonated very deeply with me because I, I realized now, looking back, that I was doing something like that within my own self. Uh, my grandmother lived in the same village as I did, and next to her house was a meadow, and I used to love to go and play in the meadow. And when I went there and played, I would play with what's often called an invisible friend, an imaginary friend. And although this friend was invisible, she wasn't imaginary. Uh, she was entirely real to me while I was in that kind of state of consciousness. But then I would snap back out of that state of consciousness and just be, you know, an ordinary little boy running around. Um, so yes, there were indications of that kind, 
but you'd probably have had to look, and I would have had to look, in a particular way to get any sense of them. So there was this kind of sense of two lives running parallel in a way, and not often connecting with one another. And I think that may be less uncommon than it sounds. I think that mm. may be true for a lot of children, actually. Mm, yeah. And that part of the change we're seeing in the world is that for more and more children, perhaps, my feeling is anyway that this is the case, that it's easier to move between those different sorts of reality, the reality of the outer world and an inner world reality, and to keep a connection going between them. So that later, as I grow a bit older, then I really closed all that off for a long time, for years. And it was only when I got fairly well into adulthood that it began to awaken again. And again, I think that's fairly typical. You know, it's often the case that as we grow, we, we need to get to grips with the world. You know, we need to, it, it's a practical world. We have to be yeah. practical. Absolutely. Yeah. In Ayurveda, we say, you know, those middle years, are, it's the pitta stage, which is all about building. Yeah. Yeah. You know? And uh, and yeah, we, you know, we, we have a 3D reality. We have a material world and we need yeah, to, yeah. you know, feel safe and secure. Mm -hmm. so Absolutely. I can see how that those aspects would get shut off. Um, mm -hmm. you know. Do you mm. remember, do you remember your first experience of channeling? <laughs> Um, yes, the first experience I had of which I was, as an adult, consciously aware of a communication happening with some other different reality or kind of being, that came at a time when I was doing some um, age regression work or past life regression work. So I was being guided through that, you know, I was being helped and I found that very useful. And at some point I was aware, it kind of came out of the blue for me, but was within one of these sessions of receiving a message. And it was one of those messages that one can sometimes have that are really very uh, gnomic in, in the sense that, hmm, I'll, I'll tell you what the message was in a moment. It's like, okay, what am I supposed to make of this message? And the message was very simple, but uh, had this kind of mysterious quality about it. It was, you are who you think you are. And as a statement, that's, it's powerful, but it can be read in lots of different ways. And so for a long time, you know, I would turn this message over in my mind and think, um, what does that mean, actually? But th that was the first adult conscious experience of, oh, a message has come in from someone else. I, I don't know. I had some sense of, it, of where it was coming from, but its meaning was opaque to me. And it existed as a single instance and wasn't followed up for a little while. Mm -hmm. So when I began to channel, there were instances like that with gaps in between, which were probably kind of digestion time or helping me to open up in some way. It didn't happen all in one overwhelming whoosh for me. It was much more incremental, which now when I kind of look at back over my shoulder and when I consider the wisdom of the beings I'm fortunate enough to work with, I think they had me figured pretty well. <laughs> yeah. I don't do overwhelm very well. Well, I was going to say, yeah. Step by it, step, it, yeah. <laughs> it could have been very overstimulating if, you know, if, if all of a sudden... Um, you know, you had lots of messages coming through and your yeah, body yeah. hadn't had the time to settle and process, actually, you yeah. know, um, uh, you know, this this presence that yeah, that yeah. Uh, was, was coming through. Um, curious. I'm curious to know, do you remember your age when you first had that experience? Uh, yes. I mean, that was really not long before I started beginning to teach. So a, a huge temerity, really. Um, but I think it was around about 1988, mm. which interestingly was a year. So I was, um, uh, <laughs> yes, <laughs> I was 38 <laughs> uh, or thereabouts. Mm. Um, and interestingly, that was a time when a lot of people were experiencing an awakening. It was, a, you know, one of those uh, 
uh, of my generation. It was a time which seemed to hit a lot of people hard with a sense of this is time to wake up. 88? No, it's probably a year or two before that. Um, but yeah, so another instance of these kind of sudden events was when I was uh, you're really basically learning to meditate. I mean, I was late coming to meditation and had very little idea of what it was, but something within me, you know, my, my temerity amazes me sometimes, but there's just something within that says, do this. Um, and so I sat down and thought, okay, right, I'll learn to meditate. Um, and on one occasion, I was suddenly aware, um, as I meditated, of being in a circle of beings of light. And this was 1988. Um, and all of a sudden, they shouted at me really loudly, wake up. <laughs> and it makes me laugh because it was probably another 10 or 15 years before I sat down and thought, oh, those wake-up calls people talk about, that was my wake-up call, wasn't it? <laughs> but again, like you say, yeah. you know, again, you know, 15 years, yes, in, in a material sense, it sounds like a long time. Yeah. But, in, you know, yeah. in a spiritual sense, it's not at all. Um, mm. you know? That's true, yes. Mm -hmm. And it, it amuses me, really, the way in which um, my personality self can be really quite slow to catch on <laughs> <laughs> so again, in ayurveda you might be i, I should actually you know i should uh, you know we i should uh, we should do your consultation your ayurvedic consultation you might uh -huh. be quite kapha um yeah. which is more a bit more sedentary and a little bit more you know slow and ploddy and takes time but then yeah. you know yeah. once you once you get to grips with it then um you know then many others are able to to really be supported by by mm -hmm. you know the bounty mm -hmm. of you being inspired um you know by um uh, by what you you know like you say what you were born to do um so so first experiences of channeling so when did you when did you commit then when did you actually sort of like you know just put your hands up and go okay okay guys you know i'm ready now mm -hmm. <laughs> you know how, how did that happen mm -hmm. Hmm. again it, it's it's a good question but not necessarily a simple one to answer so i think that commitment was incremental and, and really continues to be incremental i would say you know am i 100 percent committed to what i'm doing i suspect my guides would say way to go chris <laughs> um, so there's that feeling of always being as committed as i can but then looking back and thinking, well, I wasn't that committed, was I? You know, I was all over the place. Um, so that's one kind of answer. I think that another kind of answer is that as soon as I found that I was able to connect with my first guide and to practice channeling with an immensely helpful being who was endlessly patient and very good humoured, uh, there was simply something about it that I found fascinating, you know, just enjoyed it, really. And so in many ways, there wasn't a sense of, I commit to this in the way that uh, one might take a monastic vow, for example, mm. much more a sense of, oh, I really like doing this, I'll do some more. Mm. And so it, it's been much more like that for me, I think, mm. which I which I feel is essentially a good way for all of us you know follow the joy as the saying goes follow the there's, joy there's yeah. so much wisdom in that yeah and actually that's really interesting because just before um we came on i'm just looking for the article i was just reading an mm. article on actually an irish journalist mm. oh here it is an irish journalist called um martina pudi and um, she was one of BBC, the BBC's best known reporters in Northern Ireland. And uh -huh. she actually, she abandoned her career mm -hmm. in, in front of the camera to actually start a new life as a nun. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. it's, I mean, it's fascinating, isn't yeah. it? How, how actually we can have experiences. And for mm -hmm. you, like you say, you, you've committed to it because actually it's joyful and you enjoy mm -hmm. it. And, mm -hmm. 
Um, and, and hey, you get to support all these people by doing what you do as well. Um, and then there's another, you know, path where, um, you know, and she, you know, she, she actually says in the article, she says her decision to become a nun was like a makeover in reverse. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, and, yeah. and you know, and and a very different you know path where she quits this yeah. big yeah. career as a journalist, and you know, so so you know, so um, yeah, she takes that path as well. And I think it's, mm-hmm. I think this is fascinating because my 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 feeling, and certainly mm-hmm. from people I'm speaking to at the moment, is is we we you know we there is an there is an awakening um, taking yeah. place. Yeah. You know, yeah. we've had yeah. a year hanging out in our homes um you know mm-hmm. sort of disconnected from society and um you know in the ways that we know mm-hmm. and this has caused a lot of us to really um connect more more deeply you know have more time um and and um so if you hadn't if i know um uh, sananda is mm-hmm. is your key guide if sananda yes. had not become part of your life chris um, what what do you think you would be doing? Again, a fascinating question, and again, one that has several different kinds of answer. Really, um, I think that my sense is that Sananda has always been there. So the question for me is more: What would have happened if I'd been uh, more diligent in ignoring his presence? <laughs> um, and I can well conceive of a lifetime in which I would have done that. I think it would have been very uncomfortable for me. I think I would have been a very angry person, probably, um, because I would be putting a lot of energy into ignoring something that really deep down mattered to me a great deal. And my feeling is I would have to create all sorts of strategies to distract myself from that and probably be a little bit random in the world. So that's one kind of answer. Mm -hmm. Another kind of answer is a more direct experience where this has only happened to me once, but, um, and I don't know how you or people listening to this might feel about the idea of alternative lifetimes existing in parallel to the one that we are actually living. But on one occasion when I was meditating, I found myself with another version of myself. Um, And as far as I could tell from this brief connection that we had, our paths had diverged when I was around about 17. And um, being of that generation, this other me had taken the hippie trail to India and become fascinated. Um, I have a my first career was as an artist and had become fascinated in Indian textiles and fabrics and had gone into business uh, importing uh, Indian textiles into this country and done rather nicely, thank you. Um, And so as I encountered him, you know, obviously he was the same, it was a parallel life, so he was the same age as me. Uh, He was way more successful financially than me. Um, So was living the the dream in a sense you know the sports car the holidays on the riviera that kind of lifestyle that was where i encountered him but he wasn't happy um he wasn't deeply unhappy but there's just a sense he'd reached a time when he was feeling empty Mm -hmm. um and so the entire point of the meeting as i understood it was that he was able to teach me about being a bit better at business and I was able to teach him about opening up to his spiritual side. Yeah. And that was the kind of function of the that coming together in meditation. Mm-hmm. Now, what status all that has in any kind of reality, I've no idea. Maybe it's just an, uh, it's an idea that I was exploring rather than a real parallel life, if you see what I mean. But it gives me an inkling of one of the options that I could have followed. I could see that. I might have opted not to go to college and then go off. And and all of those things are conceivable at the same time. So here's another kind of answer. There is a feeling of a great deal of mystery about the connection in our lives between free will and determinism. 
Philosophers puzzle about it still and have done for many years, of course, and will continue to, no doubt. But for me, there is simultaneously a sense of being free to choose. But every time I look back at the pattern of my life, it seems to me that so often um, the reasons that I gave myself for making the choices that I did were really nothing to do with what was going on. Mm -hmm. There were, you know, I made choices to go to different parts of the country and it, in the course of my life. And looking back on it, it seems to me that the primary reason for those choices was to meet the people I went to meet. Mm -hmm. But at the time, that wasn't why I was making a choice. I was making a choice because there was work here or mm -hmm. education there. And those were what I was telling myself. But with hindsight, having looked in, into past lives and seen how often I've met people I've known before, there's a sense of, hey, there's something being orchestrated here that is way beyond what my personality knows. So there's also that sense of, well, could I really actually have chosen anything else than I did? I don't know. And that's that's a that's a you know that's a considerable concept for for many of us mm. to get our head around. That mm. actually, um, that our lives almost are orchestrated. That even at the soul level, we've all almost chosen um, a path and potentially the experiences um, that you know that um, we are signing up for. Um, yeah. but also that there is, we are being guided, you know, so we may yeah. think yeah. we're making a choice and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to go to South Africa, you know, and I'm going to go <laughs> and, you know, and uh, have a great holiday. And then there's a few people I'm going to meet, you know, for work. And, but really it's the people that you're meeting for work, you know, that, that, that you know, yeah. that, that potentially can be part of this kind of this, this map of, um, you know of, of of how your life is is rolling out now um mm -hmm. so that really brings us to this idea that um you know uh, you know are we are we at different stages of evolution i mean how do we even tap into that concept how do we even how do you even consider that that might be the case or the course of your life mm -hmm. it's I do have a sense that before we come into this life, we have, all of us, a clear purpose. However, that purpose doesn't necessarily translate easily into words or concepts. For some people it may well do, but for others it may really not go into words as such at all. Nevertheless, I feel that for all of us there is this assignment, for want of a better word, that we take on. And so another way of looking at how our lives pan out is that um, it's, it's, if you like, how effectively we're able to manage that assignment. And my feeling is that, uh, you know, after this lifetime, there is something akin to a life review. And then we have an opportunity to see not just what happened, but what might have happened, and also to see the wider consequences of our actions and so on. But all of that can carry a, a sort of undercurrent of, of judgment. You know, you did well, you did badly, this kind of thing. And I think that that can be rather dangerous for us. As humans, we are so good at judging ourselves harshly. Even, even those who seem not to be judging themselves harshly, mm, I think so, you know. Yeah. Um, and so it can be difficult i think to negotiate these kind of concepts without judgment coming in mm. um and my feeling is that whilst it's interesting to think about these things the really the most important thing is is to be in the flow of our own lives to be in the in the moment you know mm. and to to let other moments look after themselves mm. and that that's probably really the most uh, Verting to that notion of following the joy, you know, to find the joy in each moment mm -hmm. is probably going to be the most effective way of fulfilling whatever that purpose was that we were assigned before mm -hmm. we came into this life. 
And in your, you know, in your thoughts, this this assignment mm. that you know, this assignment mm. that um, has kind of been penciled in to our diaries, you know, prior to <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is it are all our assignments a step for uh, humanity? Are they on that level? Are they creative? Is it different for each individual? Um, you know, is it um, is it a way? you know that 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 we create a, a better world um how how are you know in your mind how are the assignments um given you know how you know how um and and what and what are they relating to wow <laughs> another really good question <laughs> getting you thinking today Chris because <laughs> we all want to know <laughs> we all want to know you know especially those who I think who may really you know be having you know yeah, feeling yeah. That they're going into more more awareness maybe they're having mystical experiences you know and they're not they're not maybe yeah, able yeah. to sort of you know conceive what this is all about so Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm laughing because I, it, this helps me to relate to those politicians who say, oh, I'm really glad you asked me that. Yeah, <laughs> yes, While yes. frantically thinking of an answer. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can take a moment. Um, I, mm. OK, so my sense is that we all have a we're all given an opportunity to. Uh, to help the world. Mm um there are so many different ways of doing that so it, it's not one size fits all at all you know every everyone makes a unique contribution mm. um and i think that it's really not at all easy in fact it may be simplest to say it's impossible for us whilst we're in human form to assess ourselves in relationship to others i think it's best just to stay away from that mm. and to uh, as another general truth which i think is very useful to stay with the notion that everyone is doing the best they can mm. in the in that moment you know and that keeps us away from from judgment and uh on the one hand arrogance and on the other hand a overweening kind of humility which really doesn't help either just keeps us focused on on the now really but it is interesting to consider i think that uh, you know there are times when i'm meditating then really w what i see people as is just patterns of light essentially and everyone is a unique and everyone is a uniquely beautiful uh pattern of light for for want of a better expression we'll stay with that <laughs> And the interactions of those patterns of light is highly creative. My sense is that although obviously we experience ourselves as individuals because we have these individual physical bodies, if for no other reason. So it's very natural to start from an assumption that we're individual beings. But I think in a lot of important ways, really, it may turn out that it's much more like where, for instance, uh, the equivalent of cells in the physical body so that each cell in our physical body has its own independent existence to some extent its own character and function but of course they cooperate they you know they build one human body between them and i think that as consciousness as individual consciousnesses then we're we're doing something very similar really so that therefore we might say that the assignment that each person receives is something Akins that are built into the DNA of each cell, uh, but way more complex than DNA would suggest, complicated though it is. Um, I think there's a lot to be discovered yet about epigenetics, but you know, that's that's an, a different conversation. But it, not entirely different because you know we're talking about how an energy field works. So I think that our energy fields to put to change the way of talking about it, bring it a little bit closer to physical reality our energy fields as humans are interacting all the time and that the assignment that each one of us is given is essentially to optimize those interactions so that we can create at this particular stage in our evolution as humanity so that we can create an overall shift in consciousness 
so that people are a little bit less um, enmeshed in the physical, still mm. physical beings, but mm. less, uh, less inclined to solely identify with the physical, shall we say. Mm. So that the more of our innate capacity for creating beneficial change in the world is is revealed to us so that we can work together in new kinds of ways mm. so my feeling is that the assignments that are being lived out on planet earth at the moment mm. in one way or another are all contributing to that you know sometimes it, it may be that people's role is to to act out what we fear as humanity mm. collectively so that we can see people in the world behaving in ways that we might consider to be very detrimental, but they still may be having a valuable contribution mm. to to demonstrate, to show us mm. what we don't want as well as yes, what we do absolutely. want. Well, no, I mean we we talk about Maya, mm. you know, in the spiritual sense yeah. of illusion. Yeah, and, yeah. And and in order to sort of come out of that dream spell. Um, yep, you know, yep. which is a word that was used by uh, somebody else I've interviewed. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we absolutely we need uh, we also need to see these things manifested in a material plane. You know, so that absolutely yep. we can say, well, actually, no, that doesn't feel right. You know, that's that's mm -hmm. kind of not the way I would want to see society and certainly humanity. You know, yeah, yeah, moving yeah. Um, mm -hmm. and. Um, and just to just to really bring it back, because again, you know, we have a wide, wide or quite a wide audience that will um, sure listen to this interview. I just wanted to just touch on well, we have you here, Chris, because this is all mm -hmm. fabulous information. Um, you know, if we think about the sort of the psychic body, um, this is how mm -hmm. I'm thinking about it now. Is is sent on a mission almost. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, so we're interacting, as you said, we're interacting with different happenings, persons, things mm -hmm. around mm -hmm. us, and that might be helping us assimilate what our our mission is. Um, mm -hmm. Now, how do we now we live in, you know, at the end of the day, we live in a very material world, you know, from schooling mm -hmm. where we're, you know, we're told you know, follow this path, become this, 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 and, you know, and uh, this is the lifestyle you have, and this is, you know, this will bring in you a good wage, and um, and everything will be hunky-dory, you know, um, and, um, and obviously, <laughs> you know, we'll grow into big children, I like to think of, because I think we never really, you know, we never really <laughs> lose that, <laughs> um you know as we become big children um you know as you said you know that that sort of that reality that notion um uh you know starts to to dissipate somewhat and um and ultimately you know we're all we're you know ultimately we we all we want security we want love you know i mean really it, it's very simple um so how you know if if somebody is listening and they're 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 feeling actually this degree of shift or change and they feel they sense what um that mission is for them or that project is but they're a bit nervous you know because they built this life and it looks yeah, a certain yeah, yeah. way and um yeah. and you know to step out of that um you know might be a little bit of a challenge um and also people might consider it to be you know there's the other side of it is when we we kind of i think when the body isn't completely assimilated and and um and also we um it can be very altruistic which is a wonderful thing um mm -hmm. but again quite difficult to move a project forward um if it's mm -hmm. not embedded in sort of a sensible strategy um, so yep. sorry, a bit long-winded way of asking you, but what just what mm -hmm. are your thoughts there? You know, how would you what what would you know what would you recommend um you know for, for people who may be wanting to step up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. It's you know, every, everyone's different. And so it may be that there's a limit to how much general advice is helpful. I'll give it i'll give it a go but you know for anyone listening i think it is important to appreciate that you are a unique being and your way may be different from everybody else's way there's nothing wrong with wanting a comfortable life i think you know it's as you indicated in what you were saying it's that's we we like comfort we like love and absolutely 
um, love is at the heart of it all. And to be loving to ourselves is, you're not going to love anyone else if you can't love yourself at least a bit. So being kind to yourself, I think, is really important. And I personally, I think it's, it's good to get away from the idea that following a spiritual path somehow means that you're going to have to uh, give away all your possessions and have a single loincloth or, you know, cloak or whatever it is, the garment of your choice and take a begging bowl out into the street. I'm exaggerating to make the point, mm. but there can be a feeling, I think, for many people that a spiritual path is about self-denial. Mm. And I understand where that comes from, because there's a kind of truth in it, I think, in that it is about teaching ourselves that the whims of the personality are not always in our best interests. And so in that sense, there can be a denial of the self that says, oh, I'll just have another slice of cake, you know, <laughs> learning to, to be a little bit, no, are you sure you really need that slice of cake? I like cake personally, so this is close to my heart <laughs> um, but beyond that I think the notion that self-denial it, it, it can become a cunning ruse that the personality self uses I think so you feel an instinct towards the spiritual in your life wow. dear listener mm -hmm. and then a voice comes in and says ah but if you turn spiritual you're going to be you know it, it's going to be sackcloth and ashes all the way it's going to be getting up at four o'clock in the morning to meditate for three hours before you go to work and that sort of fear can come in and whilst i absolutely acknowledge that for me uh first of all discipline is a challenge and i also recognize that a degree of discipline is very helpful to me i would actually say to people don't bother about whether you've got to be disciplined or not, just pay attention to uh, that light which is within everyone and to really appreciate that you are a beautiful being. And anything that tells you you're not beautiful is actually lying to you. But you don't need to get into a fight with your own mind. You don't need to get in a fight with your own feelings. Just gently be kind to yourself. Learn what being kind to yourself really is. And don't accept substitutes. So very often, the, the treats we give ourselves or seek to give ourselves are substitutes for something that we're craving, I think, which is deeper. That's, that's my sense of it, that we long for that feeling of oneness with life, that we long for that sense of meaning in our lives we long for a feeling of being part of something larger and those longings are often more effectively answered from within than from the things that we draw into our lives from the world around us i think thank you no need to be frightened of your your spirituality is, yeah. is the bottom line i think yeah. you know yeah. it's something beautiful that is there for you to enjoy yeah Absolutely. Thank you. Um, now you work, you also, there's a, there's a, um, uh, another individual that you, that you do do some work mm -hmm. with Carrie. So, so, mm -hmm. ha, so how, how does that work? How do you and Carrie work together? <laughs> well, it, at the practical level, we're working together less than we did so that for a while we were, we were running workshops together and we traveled around the country mm. running workshops together, which is great fun. Mm. But you know, times move on. And so mm -hmm. for it became, for practical reasons, not very manageable for us to be traveling around the country very much. We needed to be in one place. Mm -hmm. And then that seemed to just bring that phase of our work together to a close. Mm -hmm. I think it had been very valuable for us. Mm -hmm. um, and I hope that it was valuable for other people as well. So now we're, we're working in parallel rather than, um, you know, actually literally working together. Mm. Carrie is much more focused on the cancelling side of things. Mm. I'm much more focused on the, on the teaching now. Mm. Um, so I, I, I know that Carrie is very supportive of me. 
I trust that I'm supportive of her. Um, so a lot of mutual support going on, but in terms of actual literal work together, uh, mm -hmm. not at the moment, no. No, okay, no. Yeah, just mm -hmm. interesting. It's interesting that, again, um, yeah. uh, because, um, you know, it's... Uh, to meet people such as yourself doing the work that yeah, you do yeah. it's it's few and far yeah. between isn't it so it's it's quite i think it's quite magical actually when you find each yeah, other yeah and uh, it was yeah, yeah but i mean we really enjoyed doing those workshops together and and we were a, a, each able to bring different things so you yeah. know obviously we have a different set of skills and experiences yeah um it was fun to do yeah. and and at the time i was expecting it to go on for a long time but uh, you know guidance comes in and things change and on we go you know? on, we, on we go absolutely on we go um, and that brings me to my my next question actually you know so mm, mm. Um, you know it's a fascinating insight into your into your life and your world Chris and um mm. so what 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 do you you know we're we're living in quite different times at the moment you know the world is mm. starting to to open up again um so what have you got to look forward to this week that wouldn't have been true a decade ago <laughs> mm. i think what it is is not so much a particular thing i mean there are particular events happening this week that i'm really looking forward to mm. um, meeting with family for instance so but you know that would have been true 10 years ago except that what i feel has changed really is that Ah, again, different ways of answering this. So here's one way of answering it. In a sense, I look forward less in that I think I'm more fully present in the moment. I'm still way to go. You know, my mind can be all over the place, past, present, future. Um, and my attention can be very easily distracted from being fully present. But my, I would say that my experience of the present moment is richer than it was 10 years ago. So that, I feel, is a way in which I've changed and developed. That then means that there's a different relationship with looking forward. There's a sense of, yeah, there's this coming and this coming, and, and that'll be great when it comes here, but I don't really need to pay it much attention. Mm. Um, but there's also a sense, and this is maybe part of that enlarged richness of experience, that the nature of time itself is changing. So I'm sort of sneaking something in as an answer to your question. You know, we're talking about looking forward. And there's more of a sense beginning for me, I think, of existing simultaneously in the past, the present, and the future. And so although the future is yet to happen, it feels as if there's a part of me already there that I'm more in touch with than I would have been 10 years ago. Mm. And that similarly, it's easier for me to, I think my relationship with the past has changed as well. It's a bit of an easier relationship with the past, perhaps. Mm. So I think, I trust that overall, I'm more relaxed in the present and therefore have a changed relationship with the future. Mm. Um it feels as though the door to the future is wider open in some sense. And I can see into that room and have a relaxed relationship with it. Mm. Something you, like that, yeah. I'd say. Yeah. And you, and you, I mean, would you, you relate that to really, you know, this evolutionary, I mean, it's, you know, when you're on the spiritual mm. path, it's, you mm. know, the spirit is constantly opening and opening mm. and opening, um, you know, um, mm. like, a, like mm. a, a lotus flower, mm. like a flower. So mm. is, mm. It, is, it sort of, is it like a bloom? Do you feel like, does it feel like that? <laughs> Sometimes, mm. if I'm honest, not always. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be great if it did feel like that always, but quite a lot of the time it does feel like that. Mm. I think also for me, there's a sense I can be, I have been, very goal oriented mm. in my life this this feeling of there's something i've got to do and for many years i didn't know what it was you know um and having arrived at some feeling of what it might be and then having done some of it there is at least a part of me that's going oh mm. it isn't all still ahead of me yeah. Yeah. so there's a little bit of that as well yeah. But along with him, there's another voice that sits inside and says, oh, there's still a lot to do. Come on, yes. get on with it. <laughs> so all of those voices continue to exist. Yeah. 
Yes. But I think that my relationship with them is easier. Mm. Uh, I can laugh about them a little bit more, perhaps, than I could 10 years ago. <laughs> 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 and you know and really just you know just to sort of you know just to mm. last question really chris um mm -hmm. and uh, is is you know you mentioned that you can get a little bit um uh, a little bit out of sorts a little bit you know uh you know and and and, and again i can see that from mm -hmm. sort of the ayurvedic perspective so what 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 do you like yeah, to yeah. do to actually ground yourself because i mean again when you're working in this way you know it's, mm -hmm. it's kind of portals are all open you know it's you know the energy is flowing so what do you what do you do to ground yourself i'll, I'll start by quoting uh, something one of my teachers said uh, which was mm, he said you know maybe we all spend too much time in ordinary reality so uh, there is a part of me that thinks ah oh, grounded schmounded you know am i bothered um there is a, a space cadet within you know um who is not interested in being grounded having said that um my experience is that the world has a habit of ensuring that i stay grounded reasonably grounded anyway for a start off although i'm a teacher i'm also running a small business you know and if you're running a small business and it is small but it is a business um you have to be a bit grounded you know yeah. there are tax returns to do there are you know so all of that is actually quite a blessing it does mean that i need to keep my feet on the ground but all of all that i've said so far is, is a little bit jokey um if we talk about it in a different way then i would say that uh, I, I live in the country and I love living in the country and being out in nature is really makes a big difference to me. Um, we have an allotment or, and although Carrie is the principal gardener, um, I'm uh, a sometimes willing assistant and just simple things like digging in the garden. I find so satisfying. Uh, there's something very, very healing, very nurturing about that, I think. So my overall feeling is that it doesn't actually take an awful lot to be grounded. Sometimes the biggest challenge for me is switching. Mm. So if I've been, say, teaching, then having to switch quickly into a different mode of looking at something practical like an insurance policy to, to use, a, from, from my point of view, a rather extreme example, mm. it can take a little while for me to get my mind from one way of operating into into that more practical way of operating i can do it but a space between is very helpful for me um and so it I, I feel that it's not so much a basic issue about being grounded it's more about that switching between one mode and another that can be a challenge mm. and actually and actually i i would like to just on that note ask another question mm. you know because actually again mm. it's um you know with 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 ayurveda which is the system i teach and practice um and have mm. built a business around also um yeah, you know yeah. traditionally they you know the vedas are the traditional healers in in ayurveda and one mm. of the you know what we, you know we were certainly with my teachers we were taught that you have to be not just mm. a healer you have to be a warrior and a technician as well you know <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Makes sense to me. So, yeah, healer, warrior, technician, you know, that's, and, 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 you know, and I put that to the side and I thought, gosh, that's an awful lot of work, isn't it, to, to really teach people about, about herbs and self-healing. Um, and then, um, you know, and then now I'm at that stage where really I understand that, that um, because, because we are sharing um, our, um light you know uh, in mm -hmm. in um, an unmainstream fashion so it's not as if there's yeah, a company yeah. that you can sign up to and and get a job oh, doing yeah. this you know this is yeah, you yeah. have to carve your own path um yes, so i yes. really like what you said there but actually i think that's really good advice is that it's okay that 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 mm. yes, you you can be you operating in this realm in one moment, Chris, and then mm. but then you've got your tax mm. returns to do, or you know, or an insurance to, to look at, and yeah, yeah. you just need that moment just to be able to switch headspace. Mm. Um, so mm. so is that part of what we sign up for when uh, 
you know? I, yeah, I think it is, you know. I, I mean, I think that my, my sense is that, you know, we probably have the option not to take on physical form. You know, that there's lots of helpful things that we can do in without taking on physical form. If we take on physical form, then we're buying into a physical world, you know. So it's there's no ducking it. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, we can yeah. try, of course. Yeah. Um, but um, no, you know, we're physical beings living in a physical world. Uh, it's full of physical objects we have to avoid bumping into if we can and, you know, all the rest of it. Yeah. Um, it's not by chance that these physical forms need nourishment. Mm -hmm. um, it's, we are designed to ingest the world in which we inhabit. You know, it's none, nothing happens by chance. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And we will, um, you know, there'll be some, some content um, with this wonderful mm. interview. So we'll, we'll, we'll put all of your links in there as well. But uh, thank you so much, oh, thank Chris. You. Thank you very much. Thank you.